And I'm also here as a uh, as a former angel investor. Bruce reminded me uh, of uh, the last time he was uh, that we were together uh, back in the '90s and the go-go days of uh, the dot-com bubble when uh, uh, there were a group of us um, who, on paper, were uh, all very very wealthy for a while, and we used to bring in startups and. Uh, uh, midway through dinner, depending on uh, how many glasses of wine, he either got a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Bruce reminded me of the fact that he was one of the only three companies that actually got a return uh, on the investments we made, and I thank Bruce for that. And he's you know, running a, 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 a focused uh, uh, startup incubator in Reston, so uh, uh, you know I, I wear that hat as well. A couple of other housekeeping um, things. I want to thank uh, the Arlington Economic Development folks for letting us use this wonderful space here, Art and Arts here. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great uh, forum for this kind of conversation. I want to also recognize Alan Merton, who is a, a, the former president of George Mason University. Uh, how many uh, young <laughs> You know, in the notion of how we think about universities as potential incubators, both on the equity side and on the social uh, purpose side, uh, I hope will be one of the issues that uh, will, will be subject to part of this conversation. I also want to recognize um, a couple of folks from, from my staff, two in particular, Nita Bidway and Zach, uh, who both were, uh, did all the, uh, the, the work to get us here. They and other members of the staff uh, managed to harass and harangue you all uh, to get you out to relatively early on a whatever day is Tuesday post debate morning um, and you know I also I was thinking this morning whether I should come you know new world or old uh, with a tie or something I'm surprised I have to see as many ties but considering the fact that I you know morphed from a, a tech investor into a politician I thought I'd wear my uniform um, I, I do acknowledge, and Mr. Slava has come in, that, that uh, in the Senate, I am, uh, uh, with my background in, in telecom particularly, and I make the comments since I was co-founder of Nextel and the only politician that says, okay, leave your cell phone on, even when I'm speaking, that's not me at all. You know, we've, we've got about 75 different in, in investments, mostly all in the telecom and IT space. People assume that I'm uh, very, uh, well, technology first. Uh, the truth is, as we'll come through in the conversation, I was very current in most everything on the technology side, uh, circa 2000, uh, which put me about a decade behind. But that still put me, puts me at least a decade ahead of most of my colleagues. So <laughs> that gives you a little sense of what we're dealing with when we talk about something with as much potential, but also potential pitfalls as crowdfunding. Um, since I am uh, uh, useless for that, at least a small PowerPoint presentation, and I promised that I would not go through the whole, uh, my whole uh, PowerPoint on the budget and debt and deficit, I'm going to try to do this whole thing today without mentioning those terms again. But I did want to take you through a couple of quick slides just to set up the panelists who will be coming on, and I'll then take my seat. And uh, uh, anxious to hear as, as, as uh, everyone here from what I think is. Uh, some of the leading lights in this area. First, um, if you listen to last night's debate between the presidential candidates, you get this constant refrain, every elected official says, you know, we love small businesses. You know, the truth of the matter is, if you look at, and this is good data, recent data by Kauffman Foundation, if you look at where all the net job growth has come in America, in the last 25, excuse me, 30 years, it has not come from what we would call traditional small businesses. It's not like suddenly that you know dry cleaners and barber shops and hardware stores are expanding in exponential rate. And we also know that it's not coming from Fortune 500 companies, even though the mix of that Fortune 500 companies is changing dramatically. Virtually all of the net new jobs that are created have been created in America over the last 30 years have come from startups. Companies that are, we used to call them gazelle firms, I'm not sure what the current, uh, correct, politically correct way to describe those firms are. Most of them are technology, but by no means 
when they all technology. I think about the tremendous success story up in Baltimore of Under Armour in terms of an apparel company, Chipotle in terms of food. There's a lot of startup activity going on, but we've seen that startup activity, particularly since the financial crash of 2008, start to decline. This is an interesting slide, but a little bit, a little bit, I think, uh, deceiving in that it sources where do these startups, where do these ventures find their, um, uh, their financing sources? You look at this, most of these show that, and this takes all businesses, and remembering that uh, the vast majority of all businesses fail, something that uh, we're going to have to make sure we help educate the crowd as they start to think about moving from crowdfunding being a social good activity into potentially equity fundraising. Um, but most of the original source of financing comes from the sole proprietor, uh, from the personal resources, family, credit card. The amount of bank loans, again, disproportionately towards sole proprietors. If you're talking about the startup companies that are actually generating employees, um, those numbers on the bank side go down dramatically. The venture capital total is really quite small. Um, now again, I'm biased as a former venture capitalist. We always thought our money was more expensive than others because we thought there was going to be value added to that money in terms of, uh, in terms of being able to help nourish and support a, uh, a venture through its, through its growth. Uh, I will say that in the probably 200 companies that I invested in, I have never, ever seen an entrepreneur ever meet his numbers or her numbers in their, venture, in, in their business plan. The notion that anybody is going to ever make a straight line of success uh, just isn't the case. And as we introduce the ability to access a whole new group of investors, making sure folks understand that no matter how good the business plan looks, if chances are it's not going to play out that way, it's going to be a challenge if we make sure we don't blow this from the, from the outside. Next slide, this just reinforces what we all know. If even within the venture capital funding community, we've seen a dramatic decline uh, of, uh, of dollars invested from a peak of about 40 plus billion down to 2010, 2011, about $10 billion. Uh, you know, the, the financial crisis washed out about uh, half of the venture capital fund in America. The amount of private equity that uh, is going in, the startups gone down, and the venture capital companies that have been, that are still in the space, the vast majority of them have moved out of the, the very, very early seed stage uh, funding cycle because the successful ones have gotten more and more dollars behind them, and it's harder and harder for a venture capital fund with its expected rate of return to do that early, early stage seed capital. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a drying up of seed capital. We're looking at the fact that most of the angel networks in America that were created, not just the kind of dinner club we had here in the greater Washington area, and we're all uh, overstatement here, but most of them have been failures. Uh, and while there remains a, a vibrant angel network, for example, in, in the Silicon Valley, the idea of angel networks, even in major metropolitan areas like Washington, D.C., have dramatically decreased. And that's here in, a, in an area here in greater Washington, um, particularly in Northern Virginia, where we have a higher percentage of tech firms than virtually anywhere else in the nation. Think about as challenging as it may be if you were an entrepreneur in this crowd this morning, of starting up here, think as hard as it is here, think if you were trying to do this same startup in Daniel, Virginia, or in Lone Oak, Virginia. Um, and the potential for crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to be a tool in small and mid-sized market America is really one of the areas that I am most excited about and again hope the panelists will comment on because um, my feeling has been that, uh, putting that on my political hat a little bit, that part of the, the opportunity that came out of the information age revolution was the fact that no matter what venture it is, you can build it anywhere. We've seen that uh, you know, World Five Ventures being built in uh, you know, Delhi and Shanghai. Well, if they're going to be built in those cities, they ought to also be able to be built in Roanoke and Danville and Martinsville. 
part of the Protestant information age that we have not gotten right in this country is you shouldn't have to leave your hometown to find a world-class job. And that promise is going to become a reality, and you've got that ability, particularly if we get broadband and other things in, you know, just do that startup in that small community, you're going to have to find access to capital. And again, I think crowdfunding um, within even kind of the traditional sources of uh, financing, particularly for small communities, uh, can be a potential uh, true win. Now, what are we at? Where, where are we at today? Again, you all will know this. Most of crowdfunding today, in terms of prior to the, the Jobs Act, which we'll get to in a moment, crowdfunding has been not based upon an equity return model. It's been more based upon you know, what kind of perks, uh, what kind of product placement, you know, what are the upside potentials short of equity. And there's been some wonderful success stories. We've got the, uh, the founder of uh, uh, Indigo, who is one of the most successful we're going to hear from uh, the stories of Kickstarter. We know about these platforms. Um, but one of the things that has changed, and uh, again, you may be the only uh, cross-section of people uh, in the greater Washington area that actually know there was something called the Jobs Act. Uh, that there was actually legislation that Congress passed in a bipartisan fashion this year. Uh, I often refer to the Jobs Act, we call it in my original version, Startup 1.0, uh, as the small bill that uh, nobody may have heard of that may change the world. The Jobs Act did basically two things. One, which is not on the slide, the Jobs Act said, let's make it easier for companies to go public. One of the things we found in the aftermath of the dot-com uh, bomb and bubble was that uh, uh, that the process of going public um, and with some of the, the scandals around Enron and so forth, uh, we came in and tightened up reporting, tightened up accounting standards, did a number of things for Starbanks-Oxley because perhaps the access to the capital markets, the public markets, was too easy in the 90s, but you know, as is often the case, I would say almost always the case, Congress never gets fully right the first time. Uh, we over tighten those regulations. The Jobs Act, uh, the Jobs Act Part One, basically release and remove some of the restrictions on Sarbanes Oxley. So if we, you get to the stage that your venture is going to access the public markets, it will be much easier. The source of what we want to talk about today, though, is this notion of can we use crowdfunding? as a source of equity uh, to start up ventures. Uh, we, you know, this is very much a work in process. And again, I want the panelists to speak to this. In a nutshell, for those of you who don't follow it um, as closely, and this is your kind of first time, it, it basically said a, a venture can raise up to a million dollars for folks under $100,000 in relatively small increments. So the risk capital is uh, uh, the lesser of, uh, or, or the greater of, either 2,000 or 5 percent of your income. If you are greater than $100,000 in income, um, you can do up to 10 percent uh, of your income up to a cap of 100,000. What this may also find, and I want to thank the folks from the Mulkin Institute, uh, Daniel and Brad, who I had some conversations with yesterday. One of the one of the outcomes of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing may be that we discover a much larger pool of accredited investors than that's otherwise uh, kind of been knowledge about. Uh, again, one of the things about the securities law, and this was, uh, uh, again, most of you will probably know this, we assume that anyone that doesn't meet the criteria of accredited investor, a million dollars of net worth and $250,000 in income, is basically a not very sophisticated investor and needs extra protections. We assume that everybody that passes those magic lines is brilliant and can lose money randomly. Um, you know, you know, I'm not sure that cliff is the exact right uh, dividing line, uh, but there needs to be some dividing line. I think Anish is going to speak to this uh, in his comments, and again, I'll try to wrap this up very quickly. But this. This tool, this is real time trying to figure this out. The SEC, I think Brad and Daniel, you said we're supposed to get the, the regulations finished uh, by the end of the year. Uh, part of the challenge is we've 
we've given the SEC an awful lot to do in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, in terms of God Bank, financial regulations do need to fail. It's a little curious. At the same time, we've given them a lot more to do, particularly some of my colleagues in the House, who are basically cut off all their funding. Um, that's a subject of another subject story, but uh, uh, we need to make sure they get this balance right. And I want to speak to that for one of them before we go to our, our, um, uh, our panel. And again, we, we're going to see, you know, I mentioned from Indigo. Indiegogo, we've got uh, the co-founder, we've got some other folks here. This is, you know, the questions that I want to leave the panel with is, one, you know, how are we going to make this determination between uh, accredited, non-accredited investors? What's the right cutoffs? How do we get this right, number one? Number two, how do we think about these platforms from the standpoint of both not only private equity raising, but hybrid public-private models. Are there going to be social purpose with the potential of some equity upside? Is there a, is there a collaboration model there? Third, this question again around, you know, how do we use this tool, not just in communities like our region here, where there's lots of smart, high-tech, savvy people, but are there ways that we can help in a, in a jumpstart this kind of tool in smaller communities that uh, candidly uh, need this uh, kind of opportunity um, as much as anything because of traditional lack of traditional early stage financing in Canada, the fact that the banks just aren't going to be back in this model of early stage financing uh, on any sophisticated basis going forward. And finally, how do we make sure, and this is going to be the challenge where again, in the kind of zeal that some of us bring to the table that we've got to get right, how do we make sure that the crowd who makes these investments are going to be educated enough to understand that even when you have a successful company, and I've had many, many early, early stage investments, where if you don't do the follow-on round, you're washed out of the wood. How, you know, how are we going to explain if a company ends up going public five years later and that early stage crowdfunder who puts in a small amount of money somehow didn't realize that they were had to continue to invest to maintain their position? How are we going to make sure that uh, on, on, not only on future capital calls but on equity return, how are we going to get all of this right? And how do we not do it with so many cumbersome regulations, again, that we snuff out this tremendous opportunity at its outset. Uh, this is an extraordinarily exciting tool. Uh, I think if we get this right, it could democratize uh, the ability to access to capital in ways that are unprecedented. Uh, I think we're, we've got a lot of work to do about, you know, also on the standard standpoint of how much value-add platforms are going to put in terms of uh, assessing the quality of the plans for coming forward. That is a wide open question that uh, I'm again anxious to hear uh, the panelists uh, uh, go through. And um, so I uh, am again grateful for everybody being here. Uh, I'm grateful for this great panel we've got. I was going to acknowledge them, but I'm going to let Melinda go ahead and introduce them all. She can give you their particular background. I thank all of you for being here. Uh, this is an exciting, exciting opportunity. Um, you know, 20 days from now, uh, we uh, uh, go vote uh, uh, for the next president of the United States. I'll uh, only add one editorial comment, not in a partisan way, but I quite frankly think that uh, uh, getting our debt, uh, getting a budget deal done, and figuring this out, this tool out, may actually have more positive economic impact on job creation over the next five or ten years than anything that was talked about last night at the debate. I need you don't have to go into the debate. So with that as a challenge, I'll turn it back over to Melinda and uh, you know, for a politician, I'm relatively close. I'm not going to have a little bit of this.
this being um, a panel on crowdfunding, we want to make sure it's also a panel that can take a lot of crowdsourced questions as well. And, and we're hoping to have a very lively discussion um, today and with your involvement. So we're talking about something that's very near and dear to any entrepreneur's heart, access to capital. Capital is absolutely critical to being able to innovate um, and to be able to create jobs and grow our economy, which is pretty critical, as we all agree. So we all know how hard it is to raise capital, and especially post-2008. What is considered early stage is much later. I can attest to that <laughs> in all my efforts to raise capital. And so this is a very exciting development, and we don't really know yet exactly how it's going to play out. So let's get started. I want to introduce first from the venture capital and early stage, um, uh, seed stage funding perspective, Tom Whiteman. He's the managing director of CIT Gap Funds. Uh, CIT Gap focuses on seed stage equity, more than 30 equity seed stage investments. $30 million in private, private equity investment into its portfolio companies, nine portfolio companies to Series A investment, and several to exit. So that's always a good thing. I want to also introduce Anish Chopra. Many of you know him as President Obama's Chief Technology Officer. Um, he is also uh, uh, the Senior Advisor to the Advisory Board uh, before he joined President Obama. He was Virginia's Secretary of Technology and previously a Managing Director with the Advisory Board Company. For those of you who don't know it, a publicly traded healthcare think tank. Slava Rubin, CEO and founder of Indiegogo. Indiegogo, as you saw from Senator Warner's slides, is one of the preeminent crowdfunding platforms. Um, Slava's done some very interesting work in this, millions of dollars week by week raised for companies around causes, entrepreneurial, creative, um, and he, Slava recently was at the White House uh, at the signing of the Jobs Act. Alice Ning joins me. Now she used Kickstarter as a platform for your patent pending invention. Um, Alice is the founder of Tap Caps, and I'm going to ask you lots of questions about how that worked for you. Um, and Jane Lee, the founder and CEO of Small Knot. It is a community crowd. Uh, funding platform for very small businesses. It uses a barter and reward model. I want to find out a lot more about how that works. So folks, coffee shops, yoga studios, um, small business leaders in the community being able to get access to capital, which is very hard to get um, from a bank. So I am Linda Whitstock. I'm an entrepreneur um, and the founder of Newsit, which is a crowd sourcing platform on mobile, big data. And it is my third business. And this is one that's been tough to raise money for. We bootstrapped, begged, borrowed. <laughs> We're finally close to revenue. We're finally close to closing an equity bound. Touch wood for you. Um, so I'm very excited and self-interested, I suppose, to hear about all the different ways that crowdfunding um, can be used. So let's start by putting crowdfunding in context. Some $2.8 billion in 2012, according to Mass Solutions. Uh, research company um, will be raised using crowdfunding platforms. So it's not exactly new. I wanted to know from Slava first how you think this is going to change the world, the equity component um, of all of this. Is it as a game changer as we think? Um, it very well could be. Um, no one really, I think, here was alive back when uh, the law passed to change all this, which was. Uh, 1933, the opposite way, Security Act 1933, but just to give a little bit of background, let's, let's do a really fast uh, history. So in the late 1800s, you have the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is actually crowdfunded. Most people don't know this, but the statue, the base was free. Uh, sorry, the statue was free, but the base cost nearly $300,000. So uh, private investors were able to provide half of it, and at the time, Joseph Pulitzer used what his medium of technology was uh, the newspapers to be able to reach out and over a few weeks raise uh, the other half of the money. The amazing thing is not so much that they raised the money, but rather uh, the average contribution was something like 83 cents. So that's how many people actually got involved. They got no equity in return, they got no names on a brick, they just got to be part of freedom. 
and uh, it really works. So if that can happen in the late 1800s, what can happen as you move forward? So then you have in 1933 the Securities Act uh, passes, which doesn't allow anybody to invest unless credit investors, IPO, all that good stuff. Uh, fast forward again, you have NPR, and they're trying to show that you can use the radio and TV, and you can actually uh, raise money through a crowd and get more people to start funding things. Fast forward again, you have the internet, social media, and uh, what happens is um, in the middle there, back uh, when 1933 happened, and I'm sorry I'm going to simplify this, but you have people who are not so nice going to, as we say, grandma, uh, in rural Virginia and saying there's oil in Oklahoma, so you should just get a piece of this. And they're like, oh, this is great. I'm a grandma. I want some, you know, positive returns. And what happened was there was no oil returns. Actually, there was no oil. They just defrauded grandma. And that just sucked because grandma complained. And she said to, like, the local government people, the senator, that, hey, I don't want to be defrauded. So they had to figure out a system. Okay, no one else can talk to grandma. You know, no grandma can invest. So we're going to use the SEC. We're going to IPO. We're going to have credit investors. Now the interesting thing happens is, um, you know, Indiegogo launches in January 2008, and just to give a tiny bit of background, and I'm sorry I'm giving a winding road here, but uh, the reason we even got to this is uh, my dad died of cancer when I was a kid, so I was 15, and if you can remember the middle of the last decade, so we're all old enough to remember the middle of the last decade, which was you have 2005, 2006, if you think about it, this is actually quite a long time ago. So you have uh, Twitter is nascent, YouTube is not owned by Google, Facebook is smaller than MySpace, Obama practically is not a word except for maybe in the town, and um, raising money on the internet was actually quite challenging. So um, my two co-founders and I, one was on the board of a theater company, the other had been raising money through investment banking with for small businesses and filmmakers, and I had been trying to raise money for a cause. We were all sharing our experiences, and at the time, Prosper was brand new, which was peer-to-peer -peer loans, and you know, Amazon was already doing well, and eBay was already doing well, and you know, Kiva you know, is a darling of President Clinton. It's kind of like, hmm, there's something very interesting here, but why is it that it's all about gatekeepers, about who gets to fund things? So we thought, why not launch an equity crowdfunding platform, this crowdfunding trust is our own concept, and uh, we right away found out about the laws, which was like, oh, that's not allowed. <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't do that. But we thought uh, that there was some there there. We thought that even though if you can't get equity in return, people would still fund things. Because there's really four reasons why anybody funds anything in life. Number one is because they care about the person, the cause, or the idea. Number two is because they want the perks in return, the product, the service, or experience. Number three, they want to be part of the community, like the Statue of Liberty. Or number four, they want profit. They want to give one dollar and they want to give five dollars back. So we thought the other first three are interesting and the, and the SEC won't stop us. So we just launched in January 2008. We now distribute millions of dollars every week. And uh, at a meta level, two years ago, there was a campaign on Indiegogo called the Crowdfunding Campaign to Change the Crowdfunding Law. <laughs> And it was actually the campaign that got the money to create the petition to send to Congress. Now, I'm not trying to take credit for the entire Jobs Act signing, but they, Paul Spinrad, was one of actually the people invited to the White House as part of the signing because that have helped stimulate some of the discussion. But let's make it all real. So there's Samantha, from, uh, happens to be from New York, but she's from upstate New York, the equivalent of, you know, middle of nowhere, Virginia. And she had an incredible small business, two years a profitable small business with a dessert company. And she went to the local bank uh, back in 2010 to get a loan. And all signs point that she should be getting a loan. Profitable, two years, past that cliff where banks will never give you a loan. So she could get a loan and they didn't give her a loan. And it was really disappointing, so she came on to Indiegogo to raise the money. And the amazing thing is now she sells her product in over 40 states in America and she's hired many new people. She was actually the only person on stage related to crowdfunding with President Obama, right? Because he basically was like, oh, Samantha, she's like really small and cute, she's like 24 years old. Like this is what it's all about, right? This um, young woman creating jobs and everybody else funded her. So that's kind of the background. The short answer is yes, it's a game changer. Uh, we have a lot of things. We have an interesting road to navigate here. And uh, we're excited. I mean, no one here really knows what the future will hold. Lots of people have opinions, but we've never seen this before. Thank you. Um, Alice, how transformational has it been for you? First of all, how much did you raise on Kickstarter, and what has it meant in practice? Um, so I actually raised 
Well, I needed 15,000. I raised um, about 19,000. Um, and it really meant the difference in a lot of different ways for my business because um, what I really originally came up with was an invention. <coughs> Excuse me. I enjoy inventing, you know, at night and on weekends and things like that. Um, I had an idea that I made work that I figured from my analysis actually had a good chance of doing well in the market. So I could see the clear market for it. But then what I needed was money. Not enough to warrant any type of, you know, VC round or, or actually, you know, uh, some type of equity like rate or capital raising round. Um, there was no way I would get a loan for it because it was a study that was mentioned. Um, Yet there were all these expenses that are coming into place, like legal fees um, for IP, just like tons and tons of things I didn't know. Um, I didn't have the time or the resources being put into learning all that stuff up front. So um, Kickstarter was the crowdfunding platform I knew about at the time. Um, it had garnered a lot of press because of, it was pre-Pebble, but it was still right around all of these you know, multi-million dollar um, campaigns. And so it was, for me, a winning situation. If I didn't raise enough, nothing would be lost or gained. You know, really no one would um, lose anything. So, and it, it basically just means coming together a campaign, making a video. So I did that. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the success from it was, um, number one, that I raised enough funding. Um, it was very, very easily received. <coughs> Excuse me. Within... Um, basically two weeks of the campaign ending, which took a month, it was 30 days, um, I had the amount. So it was literally six weeks from the time of launching that I had the money in hand. Um, I going from that came a lot of press and um, a lot of additional just research that I hadn't even um, been able to do before. So um, recognizing the market, um, getting a lot of feedback as to how, where, and why people would use this, improvements I could make, you know, preferences for colors, and, you know, attention. So basically all of the market research that I originally thought would cost multiple millions of dollars, I was able to receive from that. Um, and then additional press, and then from there, I actually ended up making a bunch of different connections that helped me to get to the next stage. So for me, it's made all the difference. Um, at the time I used it, it, you know, it was not available for equity yet. Um, that's another, that's a whole other thing. That's when you go down that route, will that be useful to you to raise crowdfunded equity? I think that um, for me at this stage, not yet, but I can see where it would be very advantageous. I think people, like what Slava said, people invest for equity, <coughs> and um, right now the model allows you basically two of the reasons. But the other two, you know, you can't actually access yet. Um, so being able to crowdfund for equity, I think, um, both, you know, with equity, that will actually open up all the different reasons for why people do that. Um, it's a lot when it comes to the regulation and rules around it. As a startup, to deal with that many investors, so that's also another consideration. I mean, it's almost like you have to. You almost have to crowdfund the legal fees that you know if you need to deal with all those investors and to get everything everything in place. But I do see the advantages of it. Right. Okay, so I just wanted to bring in Jay from Small Knot and how you see the Jobs Act and the crowdfunding provisions affecting the Small Knot platform. Is it something that Small Knot will benefit from as well as folks raising money? Yeah, I mean our market I think is a little bit different. We don't really focus on high growth startups. We focus on small businesses and like blocks for the retail shop and coffee shop, you're driving through the type of places that would populate the neighborhood. And so when we look at the job sector, we see a lot of potential. I, it, the way it's set up now, though, looks like you look at equity crowdfunding, you look at the growth of uh, actual investment. Uh, it seems a little typical for your normal level uh, top shop to actually take a hold of that for the same reason, getting the lawyers together, you know, the legal fees, all the supports that come together with that. So we see that as the model develops and down the line, we think there'll be more developments where uh, a lot of innovation will come out on the side. There is a possibility that uh, the job that type of security can trickle down to the lowest level. But um, for the time being, we remain a perks and barter based model because uh, for most people, the complexity of security is whether or not you remove a lot of regulation is still very difficult. Yeah, we're going to get into that, that point about the accreditation and how we protect grandma, you know, Florida land scams, all that kind of stuff. That, um, 
some of us are old enough to remember. So, Tom, what's your perspective on this? You're, you do see stage fund. And, and yet, a lot of companies may come to you almost pre-seed. They don't, they're not quite ready for seed in, in a way. They, they need to develop their product, they need to do a lot of stuff in the marketplace. So if they go out and raise a lot of crowdfunded equity, how do you then go to look at that um, when you come to say invest in the next round? And do you have any tips for entrepreneurs? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Morgan. Let me offer the, the vantage point from which I speak. Uh, we are an atypical venture funding structure. We are part of the, uh, the nonprofit, the Center for Innovative Technology. We have money under management from the Commonwealth of Virginia, a little bit of federal money from the Recovery Act, and some private participation from uh, the corporate strategic in the life sciences area. And we invest in, in high growth startups that are, are domiciled and that express a willingness to grow and provide spillover economic development benefits for the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it's been my, my experience to work with this. Uh, spirited and somewhat delusional subculture of individuals that start to fund uh, high growth companies. Uh, and that's what we're, what, the way I, what I bring to the country to investment. We've got various sources of funding, including underway the federal funding sources through the SBIR, the other grant program, and then downstream of us, uh, venture, venture funds. So how would we react? Um, I'd like to distinguish between how we might react and how an institutionally backed venture fund might react to a company that comes in with, uh, with antecedent to their crowdsource funding. And we would probably take a somewhat more forgiving approach, but we'd be looking for some of the same uh, basic parameters of investment that, that uh, a downstream and larger investment or the investor would look for. Um, we would certainly want to understand the structure of, of the deal, the terms under which uh, the, the previous funding had, uh, um, had, had participated. And we would want to, want to be sure that that was a manageable structure of moving forward. Um, so we, we tend to like to see individual investors bundled with a single purpose LLC rather than have you know, a, a very uh, uh, long and complex uh, and hard to unwind cap. They want something with downstream investors would generally want to see as well. So I think it really comes down to the structure of the deal, understanding the terms, making sure that they are market and aligned. Uh, with, uh, with our expectations and those of, of downstream funding sources. And, and secondly, I think from a governance standpoint, you want to make sure that nothing is going to go bump in the night uh, downstream, either under your tenure or, or downstream. I think those are the, uh, those are the basic parameters that, that, you know, that we look for as a result. Anish, Senator Warner mentioned the whole issue of accreditation. I mean, what, what is that dividing line? And also, how does one protect the investor, what's your perspective on the best way that the SEC should go about figuring out these rules? Well, I actually think it's a combination of what the SEC defines as the floor and what communities do to expand beyond the base. But maybe if I can put this in context, I'll just share three uh, parameters as to how we are where we are. Uh, a little bit of history, uh, a little bit about clarification about the rules that are coming, which is going to answer the question, and then suggestions for us in Virginia. Uh, I was in the President's uh, advisory team focused on this particular topic uh, because of the President's commitment to high growth entrepreneurs. He launched Startup America as a public-private partnership to promote more locally generated communities to focus on these opportunities that folks weren't taking full advantage of. Rates of entrepreneurship were actually falling a bit during the downturn when they're supposed to be going up because in periods of economic distress more folks are willing to start new businesses. I found the story of, of Lejour in Southwest Virginia as the sort of crystallizing story for me. So I want to share it briefly. Um, I visited as part of the President's Rural Jobs Tour, and I was asked to visit uh, Blacksburg, which is, of course, as you know, Virginia Tech's university town. And a sophomore at Virginia Tech shacked up at this incubator called Tech Hat, where uh, he and one other co-founder, I met him in August of exactly a year and a couple months ago, August of last year we met, and he was building a, a Facebook app. Now, as you know, the Mac, uh, Facebook opened up its developer platform, so jobs all over the country are built leveraging Facebook's platform, and uh, Nathan Latka was representing two of those jobs. And his company was basically very straightforward. Help Main Street businesses in America build Facebook fan pages. And it was simple and profitable. I visited after I left the White House to host this Hokey Health Codathon to get folks to build apps in healthcare. And Nathan put a team together, and he was already up to 1.7 million in revenue, profitable, at very low price points, because he hit this 
market need. He's now up to, he was at that point up to 15 employees, and he was scaling rapidly. But he faced a problem. He needed capital to grow. He received a term sheet from a venture firm in Austin, Texas, for the half a million dollars he was looking to raise. Great news. Alan Burton, what was the bad news? He would have to move his company headquarters to Austin, Texas. But he loved Blacksburg. He thought he had access to great talent and engineers, great quality of life. So he was committed, but he was stuck. He had a profile on AngelList. And in that ecosystem, he was able to connect to accredited investors that don't live in Blacksburg, but what could discover a story like uh, Lejeune. He attracted the attention of two very prominent angel investors, David Cohen at Techstars and Dave McClure at 500 Startups. These are, in the high-tech community, the rock stars of angel investments. And uh, they essentially bet on Nathan, which unlocked local accredited investors in Blacksburg. The combination of the two raised the half a million he needed. And Governor McDonald was down there not even a year to the day I met him for the first time, announcing that with the capital Nathan raised, he'll create 50 jobs in Blacksburg over the next two years. Now, what did we learn about that story and how does it relate to the Jobs Act? There are three elements to the Jobs Act that I think could answer the question about accredited or unaccredited investors. Point number one, the Jobs Act broke open the door of secret Sand Hill Road meetings. Today, if you wanted to go raise capital, you go to Silicon Valley and you sort of you know, bang the, the, the lords of, of finance in Silicon Valley for your startup. Because you couldn't publicly disclose you were raising money. We have these solicitation rules for securities. Well, we've opened up in the Jobs Act a provision called general solicitation. And what that means is I can leverage the internet to let people know that I'm looking to raise capital. And it starts with the very principle that accredited investors in Blacksburg don't know to invest in my company. But here you have a Blacksburg company getting validation from Silicon Valley Angels unlocking local accredited investors in Blacksburg. So if you do the math, just accredited investors alone ignited by the potential to connect the securities through online channels will create billions of dollars of late capital that can be put to startups, point one. So provision of the Jobs Act, before we even get to the crowdfunding legal structure, is the opening up of the online tools for uh, uh, credit investors will have itself a benefit. But today, the accredited investors, as Senator Warner pointed out, they don't get investor protection. As, as Senator Warner said, they're just expected, hey, here's my business plan on a napkin. You can invest legally because you're a genius, you're, you're a millionaire, uh, but that's not sufficient. So the punchline is, the accredited investor who goes through a crowdfunding platform where the SEC will set basic investor disclosure rules will have more investor protection than a general accredited investor. Are you talking about social validation and what kind of transparency measures would come Well, about? so you have the three elements of social validation. Point one, now I can have, the SEC can set rules for what the company has to disclose. It's not going to be 10 years of audited financials, but it'll be something, it'll be a baseline, and the SEC, I have confidence, will set those rules. It's better than zero. Number two, as we use these online platforms because of the social web, you'll see validators. Every community in Virginia has that respected elder community who can invest in startups to signal to others that it's okay to come in. And that will have a fact. And then finally, and I'll leave it at this point, it's not just equity crowdfunding. It's also all securities, which means debt. One of the opportunities that I had was to help seed some energy incubators to, to the White House and put a project together to close the solar financing gap. A crowdfunding platform is raising debt securities to uh, allow folks to crowdfund solar panel installations on community buildings where they get paid back as a share of the savings on the energy bill. So if you combine the social power, you combine the investor disclosure, the last leg of the stool is you shift the pivot to wealth as the line to the answer to your question, it's education as the line. If I can take a Series 7 and I can be a, a securities trader, or uh, I take Merrill Lynch's exam to justify what I want to invest in in terms of an aggressive investor, something north of Merrill Lynch's exam and south of Series 7 will be an exam we should create community-wide 
that would allow us to solve this particular problem. And so the knowledge base would be sophistication as the lever as opposed to wealth. So Slava, I wanted to bring you in because I want to know, in, in your wildest dreams, if you could architect this for Indiegogo, the equity piece exactly has as you want, how would you handle the um, protections for investors? Uh, so I'm going to give two other stories real quick to set the context and then I'll answer that question, which is uh, story number one to the question about uh, will investors ever come in uh, following crowdfunding. So there's a campaign on Indiegogo from these two engineers that, uh, from California that went to 43 BC, Sand Hill Road, all that good stuff. And they said, hey, will you fund us? And every single VC, sorry, many VCs said they would fund them. But every single VC turned them down, and this is how they turned them down. This is what a turn down sounds like. It goes, I love this. This is amazing. All you need to do is bring this to market. Show us that you can sell out your first line of the product. And as soon as you can show us the revenues on that, come back, and we will grow this business for you. That is a clear no as he smiles, right? <laughs> now the takeaway here, this was a really cool tech product gadget, you know, gadgets you can discuss strategically, can scale, same way, but in terms of margins, but they went online on Indiegogo, they got funded, they got funded in 30 days, and within three weeks, they raised a million dollars of investment money after Indiegogo. The reason is, they actually accomplished everything the VCs asked them to do in 30 days. They proved that there was a market, they sold the product, they showed the revenue, they showed everything. Showed the market, everything was done. They got a million bucks, they're now partnered with Apple, they're totally doing well, it's lovely, great, tough, good story. Okay, number one. Number two, um, is there opportunity for social validation? Uh, Here is a probably the first story of the kind that soon will be many, 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 as I was mentioning kind of more, to change the world, which is um, Nikola Tesla, you know, arguably the person who invented electricity um, in competition with Edison. He has a laboratory in New York, in Long Island. It's the original laboratory where he created all of his exploration. And it's about to go for sale, and it's going to probably turn into a Dunkin' Donuts. Literally, it's going to get demolished, and it's going to turn into a Dunkin' Donuts. So there are some local people that are like, this is a travesty. How can this happen? And they're like, well, the guy owns it, and he wants to sell it for $1.7 million. It is what it is. So they got together, and they were able to go to New York State, the government. They're like, how are you letting this happen? They're like, well, we can't. I mean, we can't just, this is a private property. You can't just buy it. They're like, okay, New York State taxpayers. The government said, we will give you $850,000. We will give you half the money if you can prove to us that actually people care about this. You have to go raise this money on a platform, show us that people care, and we'll give you the other half. They go on Indiegogo, um, and they were able to raise that $850,000, I think, in 60 hours. And they were able to raise net net like $1.3 million. They get the $850,000 match. Congrats. We're talking about the essence of public private partnership here. Right? This is taxpayer money being deployed based on how the local taxpayers really are telling them to deploy it. I mean, that's pretty exciting. Now, to answer your question, um, there's actually four, five reasons why, there's five reasons why entrepreneurs should be crowdfunding. And you really mentioned some of this already. Which is number one, you get to um, gauge demand, which is really exciting so you don't have to spend money foolishly. Number two is you get to test your marketing. Do you old women like your product or young girls, old men, young boys? You can really be nimble with that. Number three, you get more promotion than you ever could on your own. Social discovery, exposure. Number four, the hands down the most important, and probably now you'll see me mention this, is you get the data. You get to nurture the relationship not just have a transaction. You're probably still in touch with all your customers because you have the information. And number five, oh yeah, you get to have money. So that's really good. Um, how would I architect it? In, in my opinion, um, I, I'm, I'm more of a hands-off, you even said heavy hands. I think that when e-commerce came out, you know, the government had an opportunity in the 90s to do the exact same thing. You know, there was this 
fancy internet fulfillment, people defrauded, eBay, Amazon, this is really going to happen, this is millions of dollars. And somehow industry was able to convince the government to be like, yo, give us a little bit of breathing room here. We have to run a company. We want to be profitable. We want to make a really good business. We'll figure this out. And government said, okay, you have a short leash, but go ahead. And now you have the internet, which happens to be doing quite well with commerce. Right? <laughs> In my opinion, the worst thing that could happen is the government could come in and say, we know how to fix this and how to manage this. You know, people tell me, I've been doing this since January 2008, and the SEC or somebody tries to tell me, you have to worry about fraud when this happens. I've been worrying about fraud in 2006 when we came up with this idea. We deal with fraud every single day. You might ask how, that's part of the secret sauce of Indiegogo. But, you know, we want to be a profitable business, right? Because we don't want to have clients be prodded. We don't want to have a bad brand. We don't want to have campaigns that are stealing money. Well, you worried about liability issues as well. Sure, all those things. Right, I mean, we aren't actually liable for a specific campaign. But um, all those things are in the best interest of a platform to do well. So what I would say is, I would love for many of these educational items, many of these points about being able to see financials or how many financials, I think that should be the market to figure it out. Because campaigns that get funded obviously are doing something right. Campaigns that don't get funded are obviously not connecting with their audience. Yes, there needs to be some level of information sharing. The audience will tell us. You know, our funders complain to us. You know, they say we have not gotten this amount of information yet, so we figure out our platform to improve it. I mean, it's just a matter of time. This will all be built into the product, the user experience. Right Right now, you're saying, well, I don't know if this is a good campaign or not because I can't trust it. It's just a matter of time before there's functionality which will show you a barometer of how much you should trust this. Right? Everything that you think you want to know will be built into a product. Where there's a need, it will be fixed. This issue of trust, though, I want to bring you in. Paul Knott, how do you manage that? Um, you know, people are trying to decide on which, which dry cleaner or which yoga studio they're going to win. Sorry, how much transparency can you provide them? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we just take mobile. Like what we do is take crowdfunding from the internet and map it onto a mobile geography. What happens if you take this concept and you put it into your neighborhood? And I think by doing that, we have built in inherently a lot of the accountability that is, uh, is a little more difficult to get on the internet. So, I mean, with, with the broader platform, we see a large growth of how social media and how social enforcement takes a very large role. That when someone uh, does something bad online, the internet tends to uh, respond to it. People all over the country tend to have a reputational sort of uh, enforcement mechanism built in, which I think is what you were hinting at, that it's hard to get away with things that the systems themselves generate in a way to avoid it. And then for us, we have the additional layer. If you are looking at a local dry cleaner or a local coffee shop, you're able to walk down the street, walk in and see how well it's doing. You can see, is this place empty? Is it full? Is it terrible? Is the coffee great? Did they clean my clothes this week, or is the giant stain still there? And by having that sort of global accountability, we sort of try to bring real-world relationships and, and, and map that on how possible it is. So for us, we've been very focused on local for that specific reason. How do you take the real-life relationships you have and you can build, deepen them, and allow that to serve as an important mechanism for us funding them? Tom, I wanted to bring you in on this issue of you know using these platforms for um, you know market testing and a way to kind of prove social traction. Is that something you're seeing? Is that a, a value would you say to some uh, companies that approach you, hey, go use one of these platforms, see how you do, and then come back? Uh, yeah, for sure. We're seeing that on, on an increasing basis. And, and I think there's tremendous value in that. We talk about the five reasons why, why you crowdfund and, 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 and money yeah, add. Great, even if you don't get, get the funding, you've got yourself a service to participation in a platform like this. Just to pick up on that last point, though, you know, I, I specifically like this for affinity investing or, or, or highly localized investing. Um, I, I, you know, to me, that, that, that's a, a natural fit for this. So, Anisha, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know different ways that the SEC could play out here that may help or hinder this. What are your biggest hopes and what are your fears in terms of the way they might interpret this law? Well, clearly the biggest fear is that they over-engineer this to the point where we never get out of the gates. So the, the, to me, the yin and yang is that the SEC sets essentially a floor which allows for the innovation and creativity to flourish, but that individual pockets of 
communities experiment with how to bring it to life in their communities. So here's the theory as I see it. Uh, by the way, the, uh, Virginia recently was awarded an innovation grant from the Commerce Department called the Virginia Innovation Partnership. This is UVA, Virginia Tech, and SRI co-managing a statewide program to bring research ideas out of the universities and into the commercial markets with spot $50,000 grants to get them to that proof of concept stage. And in the proposal that was awarded by the uh, Commerce Department, the proposal included crowdfunding potential for equity investments in those startups as they were moving from proof of concept stage to early uh, uh, angel investment rounds and beyond. So here's the analogy. The SEC allows for this platform to exist, but Virginia sets up the Virginia uh, Angel, uh, say, take Indiegogo slash Virginia Innovation Partnership. And now that sub-community sets its own rules within the overall framework. And that would say things like, maybe we want to have an investor protection test. So there'll be the accredited investor exam. So sort of an eBay type self policing You create these so localized markets. So we might have more trust as alums of Tech or, or, or UVA or Mason or what have you, to invest in the professors that get a chance here because we have that social affinity and we have greater levels of investment protection because there's more disclosure or there's scientific validation. So I hope you'll see Yin and Yang collaborate. The community, Virginia birthed this law. This is a bipartisan Eric Cantor, Mark Warner creation. And the president called for it and signed it. It's got to be Virginia that brings this to life in our neighborhoods with enough broad freedom at the national level so we can experiment and, you know, this is lean startup. It's the, it will learn, we'll react, we'll pivot, we'll make better judgments, and over the next several years we'll get it right. Here's the math. Warner slide showed $10 billion of angel investment, or of, 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 of equity capital in the uh, early stage market. Fred Wilson at Union Square Ventures, who's one of the most respected VCs in America, has estimated this is a $300 billion market a 30x increase on the last data point that you saw Senator Warner. That is a market to fight for. That is a market to try to exploit if we can get foundation of the SEC and experimentation in Virginia to test, validate, and scale the best approach. So, so in that case, um, Slego, you're, you're expecting a bit of competition then. I imagine there's going to be a lot of new um, entrants into the marketplace, a lot of folks trying to compete with you in Indiegogo. Um, yeah, so Indiegogo is uh, the largest funding platform in the world, opens absolutely any idea. Um, so the reason I say that, there's zero judgment, there's zero curation, which is very interesting as you start talking about for-profit investments, because we probably wouldn't do that still. Um, I mean, we probably still wouldn't curate, but we don't know. Um, because we believe in like the Google eBay philosophy, but the open markets aside. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we have competitive platforms funded on Indiegogo. Platforms that say we're going to be better than Indiegogo, and then get <laughs> which is great. Which is great. I mean, there's actually like 750 competitors right now. I think it's an enormous market, and I think there's plenty to figure out. I think this is all better. In terms of <clears throat> you asked me before some of the rules, I think that um, one there's the rule of whether or not you need to be stamped by the SEC. Like you can work with these guys. They're stamped or they're not stamped. Um, this is really strategically bad for me to say, but I'm not pro stamp. Right? I should be pro stamp because we're going to get stamped, right? And most people will not get stamped. But see, as soon as you stamp us, it means that you're not allowing for openness for others to, you know, thrive. It, it should be potentially like you can get like Better Business Bureau, like, hey, they're doing good work, like we believe in them, but you shouldn't say, don't go to them. You're not allowed because as soon as you don't allow stuff, you're stopping. It's kind of like saying you can't create a competitor to Amazon. They're not good enough for you to buy stuff from. It's kind of not open innovation. Again, this is bad for me, strategically. Then the, uh, the next thing, <clears throat> the absolutely terrible thing, in my opinion, just to be really clear, is there's this, um, you need to have an audited statement uh, for raising over $500,000. That's like full-on ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, if there was actually one piece of feedback, that just needs to be cut, not even discussed. It just needs to be eliminated. I mean, most of these companies that come to you with $500,000 investments or whatever, do they have audited statements? Like, never, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it needs, to be, it needs to be just removed. People like, will be crowdfunding the cost of their audit. Yeah, but I mean, I just, want to, I just want to be really clear. It shouldn't be debated. It should be removed. 
And the one thing that I think would be really, really important to discuss is we offer perks right now often on campaigns. You know, you get that product. A really interesting debate is whether or not you'd be able to invest into the same company that you can get perks in, right? Will you be able to get the product and get a share at the same time? Does it have to be two separate financial transactions? I think that would be really interesting in this marketplace. What about the dilution issue on follow-on rounds? Because presumably, you know, with the example that you gave, um, you know, they, they raise money, and, and what happens to all their original folks? Well, in that situation, there weren't yet equity investors, so no one got diluted. I would imagine you want to treat it in the same way. There's going to be just tranches, right? Before there was, now there's this new phrase called a seed round. There used to never be a seed round. It was called an A round. It was your first round. And besides, see, now there's friends and family. I mean, just create new tranches and figure out how to bring them forward on the ladder. I mean, I think that's fine. In terms of managing lots of uh, investors, yeah, there might be some, um, should we say, user experience complications for lawyers and stuff. And where there's that manual problem, there will be some startup that will figure it out in Y Combinator with a little bit of software. It won't be that hard. And they'll make some money, right? And um, yeah. Okay, I want to turn a little bit to some of the, the changes also in the act that make it easier for companies to file as emerging growth um, companies, regime, the IPO ramp provisions, that sort of thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? So again, when the president listened to entrepreneurs describe the challenges in raising capital for growth, we heard this as a broad uh, challenge from the earliest stages to the public offering. And the key provisions in the uh, later stages, as Senator Warner described, there are key, there are several of them that are relevant for Virginia. So let's go through, let's go them in order of priority. To me, the most important thing is we've created the opportunity for companies to test the waters for a public offering. But why is that relevant? Let's assume you're a company that you're thinking about going public. The data suggests that maybe 20 to 30 percent of those companies actually go public. But if you today file to go public but choose not to, all of your investment thesis, your S1, all your, all your data is out there. So basically your competitors know everything about you, even though you have not actually gone public. So there's a bit of a challenge to say, well, am I really going to go through with this? What we've created is an opportunity for testing the waters so companies can actually have privileged conversations with the SEC. Let's just think about the Facebook IPO for a minute. Remember, the Facebook IPO had this back and forth with the SEC over things like mobile advertising revenue. But imagine if there was an opportunity for them to have that conversation with the SEC during this test the water space. The law requires you, when you eventually go public, to have at least 21 days of disclosure of that entire conversation that you had with the SEC. All red lines. So now the investors would know what actually happened during that conversation, but they could have had it earlier. Also, you can talk to investors. You can talk to people who might want to tell you whether they want to put money into your company. Today, that's a very constrained conversation, so now you can have a confidential discussion. So those, for, and finally, for those of us who care about equity research, and the research analysts today can't comment on the, on the security for 40 days after they go public. Now they can have investor reports, research reports on day one. So you as an investor don't have to wait to say, hey, what do the experts think about this company? So those are really important provisions to increase the, co the probability that companies are going to want to go public. There's also a few provisions that say, I don't want to go public, but I need more than a million dollars I can raise from crowdfunding. Regulation A, today is capped at raising $5 million through private placement. Well, now we have the opportunity to raise up to $50 million. There are lots of companies that may not want to go all the way to public offering, but want to raise 50, and that's enough for them to scale the business. And again, tapping into the accredited investors and qualified investor institutional investors who have the authority to invest, but today don't because Reg A is not really a utilized tool. So going from 5 to 50, might there be growth in that growing in that middle phase? So if you think about the math, the big picture is this. Our economy, especially in Virginia, is heavily dependent on defense contractors, right? It's like 10% of our GDP-ish. Imagine now we have the potential to see more companies go public, which creates jobs, Companies that can stay private but raise capital to try new market opportunities, especially in areas like healthcare, energy, and education, which are growth. And we have this long tail of startups in Blacksburg, in Roanoke, in, 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 in Danville, who have the chance, even if they have modest growth ambitions, 
to have a return to their end angel investor round. And that full ecosystem is now legally allowed if we put leadership in fixing this and making it work in Virginia. That's where we are today. The interesting thing is with, uh, sorry, with crowdfunding, we keep on thinking that the equity crowdfunding is for that tiny little company that hopefully will get off the ground. Chances are, if it's structured correctly, it's the companies that already have a base actually have been making potentially small millions of dollars of funding of revenue, right? Five, ten, twenty million dollars of revenue. They have customers. They have an affinity group. They don't want to go to VCs and spend it themselves by twenty to thirty-three percent. They're going to want to go quickly to the market. Right, and say, hey, customers, not only are we going to find validation whether or not this is a good product, we want to give you a piece of the action on the upside here, and their own market will fund them. Right, so banks will get pushed out, VCs will get pushed out. So it's it's not really a matter of thinking like, will mom and pop be able to have their little company? We're talking like transformational if you really think about it. Tom, are you worried about being disrupted? You know, from my perspective, where we operate, if we're disrupted, that's good. We're more funny than better. <laughs> If uh, business will uh, we'll go uh, 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 try to apply uh, Virginia's fierce resources into another productive activity for developing technology companies, I will say, um, and I don't know what the data from, uh, from crowdfunding to data offers, but you know, it would be interesting to see how this plays out to see what, what, the, uh, what the mean amount raised by, by companies is under this mechanism if we're looking at relatively small dollar raises, or if we are looking at large downstream raises that will truly supplant conventional means of investing. Okay, I want to bring in our audience. I assume that you guys have a lot of great questions. There are two microphone positions. Actually, I think um, I can hand my mic. Uh, oh, you've got one there as well. Please, uh, we'd like to hear your question. Yes. Um, but I don't think that um, when you look at crowdfunding, you should just be happy. 
Um, I also think there are some things that are happening that uh, involve partnerships with crowd funding that might be useful for you. I mean, for example, what we do is we partner with lenders. And so what we do is um, if you're looking for a larger size loan, uh, we bring the community together to crowdfund a pool of collateral. And that pool of collateral is then handed over to the bank, and the bank will then give you a loan to you to grow. So there's ways to source capital that don't just simply go from the person to you, you spend the money, you get money back. There's different ways for arranging structures that allow um, you know, traditional capital to be unlocked through crowdfunding. So um, you know, happy to talk more about it later, but there are a lot of different solutions that aren't as big and as loud as startup equity crowdfunding that are unlocked by the job back and that um, just definitely. Thank you for your question. Thank you for and yes. Anish, how you doing? My name is Dr. Michael Morgan, and I have a company that helps uh, science and technology startups gain access to federal grant or contract dollars. I'm curious, um, is this type of crowdfunding platform on the agenda of the current administration to be able to help uh, divert some of the costs and the risks associated with science and technology developments for the government? Let me give you a good example. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Um, a lot of their grants and their contracts require cost sharing. So startups generally, in order to get a grant from the federal government, need to have maybe $500,000 or $1 million worth of funding. A lot of these uh, startups don't have access to that. Are you going to open that gate to allow um, the U.S. government agencies to do cost sharing with crowdfunding platforms? That's a great question for Senator Warner to take to the administration for feedback, but I will say there's no legal structure for that today, but we are trying to de democratize access to government contracts. So when I left the administration, we were forming a lean startup that is now called RFPEZ, and the theory is for if you're a web developer, we're starting in something simple that we understand. If you can provide web development services to the government for a contract valued under $150,000, you don't need all this convoluted, nonsensical procurement nonsense. You can go straight to the government, essentially, on a Match.com platform, present your pitch, and get your idea of contract frictionless. So we are harnessing the internet for simplifying procurement. Uh, your comment about whether you can take the cost share, there's certainly no limit against it. And that may be the kind of innovation that small mop might be able to bring and say, hey, if you're a, an SBIR company and you want to be able to create that cost share, you might offer that as a product. It's not restricted, it's just not actively described, but it, it doesn't get it clear. Yeah, I, I did speak with the director at DARPA and they said it's a great idea, they just don't know how to, to navigate through the regulations and rules to help uh, Sean, Green, Sean Green runs the SBA's innovation program where they have a regulatory authority over SBIR programs. And Sean is the lead in the White House to help bring policies forward in this area. So we should make sure you can connect to Sean and anyone else wants to offer feedback. Sean Green of the SBA is a terrific resource for questions like this. Yes. Good morning, my name is Andrew Park from e Venture LLC of Reston, Virginia. Uh, we talked about this morning primarily on domestic sources. Nowadays, the market is global. Have you ever considered looking for getting funding coming in the international source? Example, there is a program called EV5 program. Anybody knows what the EV5 is? That's $1 million investment creating 10 jobs. So I'd like to have a panel's opinion, including Senator Warner, any pro and cons opinion, a person like us, engage in ballistic armor material for U.S. military, there is any pitfall soliciting funding from foreign citizens, foreign family firms for $1 million investment in U.S. company, creating 10 jobs. I'd like to hear any member panels, pro and cons opinion. Can I ask one thing? Yes, sir. We have a plan called Startup 2.0, and we're trying to
money to be our, one of our strongest allies in the nation. The lack of ability to sell, putting it back and forth, I think, I think it's going to be continue to be a hurdle in terms of foreign solicitation on the DOD side. I think a scaled down D5 program at a lower level, non DOD, is a great, great opportunity. To so follow up questions, if I may, yeah. that's a reduced amount of investment. Are you referring to non federal government related? No, I believe we've got to define federal government or non federal government. We're just saying we need to greatly expand the EV5 program because the million dollar cap is too high. Yes, sir. And we know what we, what we basically have right now with H1B visas, it's a great idea. We also try to expand those. But in many ways, the people here on H1Bs almost become indentured servants to the companies that they work for because their ability to then go out and start their company. We push <coughs> these you know, extraordinarily well-educated people out of America if they actually want to become entrepreneurs. That does not make economic sense for America. So we want to lower the threshold um, uh, under that. That law has not been passed yet. It? No, it hasn't. We are trying. We are start to point out. I parts, you've got Marco Rubio, the co-sponsor, Chris Coons, Jerry Moran in Kansas, and uh, we hope uh, it probably won't happen in the plane dock, but we, we've got a lot of traffic. It also includes, in fact, you know, green card for STEM, STEM graduates, and we have diplomas and other things. It is broad and it's huge. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a different angle, but 61% uh, of campaigns on Indiegogo will raise money from more than one country. And uh, the Tesla campaign raised money from 108 countries. And, and how is that handled on, on, with all the different, you know, currencies? And <laughs> that's just something your platform does. It's just in yoga. Yeah. <laughs> but it is important for us to understand. The, the president saw the EV5 program as a huge opportunity administratively. So we have streamlined and tweaked the program. So let me tell you, the state of Utah has built an investment fund where they've raised roughly 50 million dollars mostly from uh, Mexicans who want to get a green card in the U.S. So what happens is the fund commits to hiring the 10 workers, and these folks pool the money. So now the fund is accountable for job creation in the U.S., and it's a creative public-private model where they're going after, uh, in this case, university spinoffs and other opportunities. But uh, the good news is the existing law has created the, the, there's some tweaks that are worth exploring, and I'm happy to talk to you offline. And then, obviously, Senator Warner's legislation is just the slam dunk on what was previously referred to as the startup visa movement, and that whole theory about talented individuals who we educate here at our university should stay and grow the economy, because the, the data is overwhelming. Uh, those foreign-owned startups have had a huge impact on our economy. Thank you very much.